Hello everyone. A first word of thanks for the opportunity to present our work developed by many people and across many institutions at this uh, Congress. In this presentation, we will describe how we have been using hyper networks to capture and analyze the dynamic of football matches. Tactical and technical aspects or actions expressed via cooperative or competitive interactions, such as duels, have been analyzed for some time now using network science tools. The limitation of these uh, tools is that they typically are applied to dyadic interactions, that is, involving exactly two elements. On the other hand, hypernetworks provide a more extensible and flexible formalism for characterizing the dynamics of a football match. In a nutshell, an hypernetwork is a set of hypersimplex, and an hypersimplex is composed, on one hand, by a set of elements of an arbitrary uh, composition. In the running example, we have three different um, hypersimplexes, sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3, with sigma 1 and sigma 2 with the same set of elements, players white 1 and white 2 and black 1, and sigma, three with, uh, sigma 2 with a different composition, namely two players from each team and a goal. Using this uh, formalism, we have been using formal football matches uh, described by the hypernetwork formed at each observation. Here, an observation provides the positional data of each of the players in the pitch. Using this positional data and a criteria based on proximity, we partition the players in the pitch in different uh, subsets. A football match is thus described by the sequence of the different uh, hypersimplexes that are formed during the entire match. My colleague Luis Ramada Pereira will explain how we have using the changes from these sets from observation to observation to gauge the match dynamics. On the other hand, an hypersimplex is also characterized by the relationships between their elements. Here, although simplex sigma 1 and sigma 3 have the same elements, they are different in the relationships that they present. And this difference is based on ball possession. In the case of the relationship R1, the possession is with the team white, and in R3, the possession, the possession is with the team black. My colleague, João Paulo Ramos, will explain or how we have been studying this relation and other relationships to characterize the match dynamics. So, what can we learn from multi-level hypernetworks approach? At the first level, the lower level, we can analyze it by what are the types of sets that are formed. We can see it in the statistical frequencies. We see that the one versus one are the most uh, often uh, sets then 2 versus 1, 1 versus 2, 2 versus 2, 3 versus 1, and 1 versus 3. We can also see where they occur uh, in uh, heat maps, histograms, that represents the position, the center of mass of each set. The, the players that are specific to those sets uh, can be uh, identified also, and the sets formed. So the specific sets could, could also be represented in relative frequencies, uh, and we can see also their position in the pitch. These statistical frequencies, uh, relative frequencies, could give us uh, some uh, additional uh, complements of ideas. And the, the, the main idea was when we put them in order. The first most occurring set, the second one, and then so, and, uh, and so on, uh, as, uh, showed us, uh, re revealed us uh, distribution, a linear distribution, a logarithmic distribution of a power law. We uh, uh, have uh, identified the power law uh, specific ziv mandelbrot and we have seen that the first, second, third and sometimes the fourth and the fifth uh, sets were uh, out of the bounds of this model uh, and we try to understand why, why they were outliers. We have seen that those were uh, made by strategic, so design, specific design. 
the first one and the, the second one are uh, always the sets constituted by the goalkeeper and the goal. Obviously, they are close to, uh, for the rules of the soccer rules and uh, also from strategic uh, uh, imposed ideas from coaches. But the third and sometimes the fourth and the fifth are also uh, uh, sets by one versus one. This means that the, the coaches had planned uh, to, to put them w together. So one uh, player from the one team and one player from the other team are stick together most of the time. And this is not obviously a behave of a complex system. This is pre-planned. This is uh, strate strategic ideas from coaches and applied by uh, players. In the intermediate level of analysis, we have seen how these sets are aggregate or disaggregate. And we have seen that the velocity changes, the speed and direction of the players add uh, an important role of that. When uh, one player moves to another direction from the other players, he uh, disaggregates from that uh, specific set. We also have an index of uh, inertia, uh, a kind of uh, a metric that uh, makes us the idea of that players are uh, uh, more is external in the, of the center of the mass or more uh, internal. So if they are external, we call it breakers. If they are uh, internal, we call it keepers. On the higher levels of analysis, we have seen that there are sets of sets uh, and they can give us the idea of local dominance. These sets I influence directly the play if we choose, uh, for instance, more proximity to, to the goal. Now I will pass to my colleague, Luis Romada Pereira. One question we can ask ourselves is if it is possible to measure the amount of change the network endures as uh, it evolves in time. Indeed we can. Using techniques from information theory, we can compute these changes. There are several methods. We selected the variation of information which measures the information distance between partitions of a network, which is basically what our observations are. Let me, let me give you this simple example. Imagine we have 12 players clustered in four simplices. Um, so simplices sigma A, sigma B, sigma C, and sigma D. Um, if at time t plus one, we observe no changes, so the simplices keep being exactly the same, um, we, we register no variation of information. There's no additional information that is required to go from time t to time t plus one. But if, for instance, two players change simplices, player number two and number three, then there is additional information that is required to go from t to t plus one, and we register that by using this metric we call the variation of information. Uh, as the changes increase, the variation of information increases up to a maximum that is basically gated by the actual partition of the network. So this is basically how we measure the changes as the, part, as, as the, as the game progresses. Um, how do we validate this you know, metric uh, as, a, as a proxy for uh, game dynamics? So basically we look for correlation between known events that generate a spike in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the game dynamics with a spike in the variation of information. Uh, we, found, we, we used corners for that. Why did we use corners? Because they're frequent, and I think no one would dispute that they generate a lot of dynamics during the game. So we, we looked at nine games, uh, nine matches, where we found 93 corners in total, and out of those 93 corners, 86 had a higher variation of information when compared to random chance. So uh, the probability of this happening is uh, virtually zero and it's a very strong confirmation of our hypothesis. What are the promises of this uh, um, <coughs> approach? The first one is that uh, if there's no changes in the simplexes, if there's no structural changes, then we register zero. We register no uh, variation of information. Uh, even if um, the sets of players are moving very fast on the pitch, if there's no changes in these simplices, then there's no structural disruption, which means that nothing basically is happening and that's what the, the, the metric is measuring. Um, the other interesting uh, result of this approach is that we can break down the, 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 the contribution of every 
uh, team of every simplex transition, which would be very important for training, for instance, as well as the contribution of each player. Um, let me finish just by showing you a graph of, uh, of one match that we looked at. Um, every match has about 60,000 observations. We have a, a few thousand in here. And we, we can see, for instance, um, uh, every single, I'm sorry, every single point, every single green point is uh, one observation. The solid line is, um, is the maximum envelope of the variation of information and the vertical lines are events that occur during the game. Uh, we can see, for instance, that the time 16, at time, time, uh, minute 16, there's a spike in the variation of information that corresponds to a, to a free kick. Then there's a whole set of uh, corners at time 27, at uh, 38, um, that uh, again, they generate lots of spikes. And finally, I'm showing you some substitutions and red cards, which usually generate, you know, uh, stoppage in, in, in play. And you can observe that in variation of information as well. Um, I will pass to, on to my colleague, um, Duarte Rebujo, for conclusions. And thanks very much. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. To conclude, Hyper networks can represent an airy competitive and cooperative interactions, meaning that all types of relationships between the players can be captured, not just the passing of the ball, but all the relevant for understanding the game, all the relevant interactions can be captured. This is a, a highly sophistication of what we know before from networks. Also, we can understand this at the different levels. We can understand this at the the tactical level of the team, we can understand this at the player level, for example, those that maintain the dynamics or that break that dynamics, and also at an intermediate level, the levels of local dominance, for example, group dominance. And finally, this also shows that we are focusing on structural dynamics. So not simply the, the summary of the dynamics at the end of the match, but how, how all these interactions happen over time and how this make, helps us to understand how um, the, the, the intensity that are not productive can be minimized from the, the matches that we are, have been analyzing. This gives us important messages for future studies. If we understand team behavior as synergic, we also understand that there is a tendency to unify. How can we capture this unification, this way of playing together? So there are many, uh, the meaningful relationships can be really highlighted and identified to understand this unification. We also can understand how specific compensations can happen and how specific um, challenges to the adversary are created. So this also has to do with the agency of the players and how they are um, cooperating with their team and competing with, we had, with the adversary. This also helps us to understand, given that this is a pattern, how this pattern is shared, how each one is doing its part for the wall. So this all has to do with agency. And finally, we can also understand the interplay between the dynamics and the intensity of the match, how this cha ch uh, change as different intensities are happening at different levels we have been discussing. This is our main messages to you and we are now uh, open to your questions.